Hello everyone and welcome to video 4.2 Behaviorism and Online Learning and this is for the course AEDT 2160 Online Learning Theories and Models. So just as a bit of a primer before we get into talking about behaviorism and online learning I'd like you to think in advance about how much of what you know is a response to a stimulus. And then the second analysis question is, what is mastery? And what role does mastery, mastery play in online learning? So I'll leave you to spend some time pondering those. And then uh, come back and we'll get into behaviorism. Now, many of you may have already come across behaviorism. Um, it's a very, very uh, substantial field of literature in psychology and in education as well. And so I'm not going to cover the entire field here, but just wanted to highlight some key points if you haven't come across it already. Um, so one of the first primarily uh, associations for behaviorism is classical conditioning. And this is associated generally with Pavlov and his whole salivating dogs experiment. So you may have come across this or heard this in one of your psych courses or it may be new but basically this is the process of reflex learning so an unconditioned response for example food is produces an unconditioned uh, I'm sorry an unconditioned stimulus like food produces an unconditioned response like salivation and when that's presented in context with a conditioned stimulus like a bell you can actually get it to a point where when the dog hears the bell the dog will start to salivate even though food is not even present so the point behind classical conditioning is that learning is by association the learner does not do anything for this learning to occur and it's sort of that common sense experience um, in this reflex process. So the other is operant conditioning, and this sort of stems off of the work that Pavlov and others did on classical conditioning. And so the person associated with this is B.F. Skinner, generally. And basically, when something emits a behavior or does something, the consequences of that behavior are reinforcing then it is more likely to do it again. And of course any of you who have worked with small children or animals know that you can actually sort of at some level make this happen sometimes in your favor. Um, so learning is really about in Skinner's mind an increased probability of a behavior based on reinforcement to create a new behavior. So learning becomes a function of change in overt behavior. And what I've done here is provided you with a link to a very thorough site on aspects of teaching and learning. It's out of the UK. Uh, the direct link here in the PowerPoint will take you to their piece on behaviorism, which then of course has a bunch of embedded links in there. I'd encourage you to look around a little bit on that site. Um, certainly read the main page that this link takes you to, but then you can link off to um, operant conditioning, uh, sort of an overview of it, and then to what Skinner exactly said around operant conditioning. So the distinctive characteristic of operant conditioning, you know, as opposed to classical conditioning, is that the, the organism can emit responses instead of only eliciting them due to external stimulus, and reinforcement is the key. So the reinforcer is anything that strengthens the desired response. And you'll see as you explore more of the links on this site, they go into much more detail um, about how Skinner has sort of seen that play out in the context of education. And he attempted to use the Skinnerian theory on a broad range of cognitive phenomena. What I would like you to now shift to, given that quick introduction and not very um, <laughs> thorough overview to behaviorism, just a, a taste of it, is to what about behaviorism in online learning? And so this is where we start to bump up against Keller and quote unquote the Keller plan. And this is PSI. It was, uh, he first wrote about it in 1968 in an article entitled Goodbye Teacher. <laughs> it's based on Skinner's behaviorism learning theories and immediate frequent feedback is the cornerstone to this. So PSI is Personalized System of Instruction 
and there are five key features of it. The first is that it's self-paced, so it's very much about going at your own pace. The second is that it's based on mastery. You need to master the concepts presented in the unit before you can move to the next. The third is one that will be interesting for you to hear, lectures and demonstrations. Now these aren't the primary ways of getting content to the learner. These are only here as ways to motivate and encourage interest um, in the learner for the different aspects of the content. The emphasis is on the written work. And so content is delivered via readings from a textbook, via a very rich, in many cases very deep detailed study guide, articles, any other resources the teachers would like the person, the learner to use. Uh, written communication between the teacher and the learner is essential in terms, because it's self-paced, that written communication helps to avoid any misunderstanding. And the instructor is expected to create the study guide, which makes expectations very, very clear, makes objectives clear, and asks questions to stimulate the student's interest in the topic. The fifth piece here is the use of proctors. Um, Keller gets very detailed in how many proctors he suggests and that there's two types of proctors, internal and external, where the internal proctors are students that are all there in the same course, but they may be a few units ahead. And so they're helping those that are not quite there yet. And external proctors are students who've completed the course and who are now acting to support learners who are currently in the course. I've given you a link to a site, uh, University of Manitoba, and if you take a look at that site, it's they've done quite a bit of work. It's called the CAPSI, Computer Aided Personalized System of Instruction. And so Joseph Pear and a lot of his colleagues have done quite a bit of work there around taking the principles with within PSI, Personalized System of Instruction, and seeing how they dovetail with the affordances of the virtual environment. Um, the paper that this link takes you directly to is entitled Teaching and Researching Higher Order Thinking in a Virtual Environment. And they have several other papers on the site, but I think you'll find this one to be quite useful I, because it describes how they actually put PSI in action in the online learning setting. So I think you'll find that a, a useful paper to read as we start to look at these synthesis questions. The first one, very broad, um, which we'll talk about in our tutorial is how can PSI create engaging learning opportunities? Uh, what is it about PSI and about the affordances of the online environment that allows these learning opportunities to really be rich and engaging? And then what challenges are inherent in the application of PSI to online learning? What can be done to mitigate those challenges? So I'll leave you with those two questions. We're going to talk about them more in our tutorial. But the other thing I'd like to leave you with is just a general sense that this has been on behaviorism. And many people think that behaviorism is something that we don't need to use anymore. That connectivism, constructivism, all these other learning theories have surpassed the need for anything that's behavioristic. And I think that's one of the areas that I'd like to discuss with you once you've had a chance to dip into some of these resources and readings um, and just get your thoughts on, really, really, uh, is behaviorism uh, dead or are there aspects of it that still uh, need to be used in the online setting or does the online setting breathe new life into some of these theories that are connected to behaviorism? So I'll leave you with all of those questions to ponder, and I look forward to talking with you in our tutorial. Have a great day.